very warm welcome to you all from a very sunny but very chilly Oxford today. Uh, my name is Freya. I work in the external relations team here at the Blavatnik School of Government. Uh, we have about one hour to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so thank you to everyone who has pre-submitted a question as well. We'll be getting on to them shortly. Uh, so please, everyone who's joining, if you've got a question, remember to put it in the Q&A box on Zoom. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass on to my panellists to introduce themselves, starting with Paula. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Paula Galvez. I'm from Peru. Uh, my background is in law, and I've been working for over 10 years now in the intersection of law, technology, and public policy. First, uh, from the private sector, working in Microsoft, then uh, counseling big tech firms and helping uh, establish their public policy strategies in Peru, and then in the public sector as a policy advisor. Hello, everyone. My name is Ade Tomiwa Victor Oroshani. You can call me Victor. Um, I am Nigerian American, born and raised in New York City. I'm actually a uh, medical student uh, right now, and I'm, I'm doing uh, taking one year between my third and fourth year of medical school to do the MPP. My background is in public health and global health. Um, I've been doing some health system strengthening work uh, for the African continent while in medical school over the past few years. Hi everyone, my name is Risa. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I am a Colombian attorney who uh, works on free, free speech and digital rights. I'm an activist. I've been doing this for several years now, like eight years. And yeah, very happy to be here. Good luck in your applications. Hi, I'm from Poland. Uh, it's funny because we just discussed how one year ago we uh, exactly in your position yeah. and now we're here. Um, so I'm from Poland. I run and develop ideas, basically journal, think tank, writing. Yeah, I think that's it. And we like, of course. Great. So to kick off, I'll start with one of the questions that was submitted in advance. So what work experiences are the most frequent in students accepted to the MPP? It's not really a typical work experience. So what sort of things did you highlight in your application? Aren't we, Victor? Sure, I guess um, in my case, it's a little bit different because I did take one year of gap, one year of professional experience in between um, my undergraduate before going to medical school. So some people come into the MPP with years and years of professional experience and others, uh, you know, come with, come a little bit earlier in their careers. And so for me, that was the case. So I did highlight that one year of public health work that I did in New York City in my application, but I also highlighted some leadership um, positions that I had in organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, in medical school as well. Some uh, roles that I played in undergrad in terms of doing research on health system strengthening. So for me, um, while I did highlight that very professional traditional work experience, I, I talked about internships and um, other organizational work that I've done as well. I think it's very good that, uh, that uh, Victor is here because the, the other panelists, like we have maybe a little bit more experience, but something that we have seen uh, in this cohort is that it is possible to come here if you're young, younger, because we're still very young, but uh, if you're younger, uh, but if you show like a, a commitment to public service, like a big interest to, to do public service and, um, you know, to improve um, your countries uh, or this world, uh, or I think we have a very, um diverse cohort when it comes to like our backgrounds uh which is really really cool because you'll you'll see when you come that that like gets like the school made a very good job of of making us speak to each other and like to bring the experience of all our classmates into a classroom so i don't know we we are like surrounded by people working on climate change on health on you know like the most different things in, on finance so that's really really cool so up next we have a question about how you chose your master's programs 
Right, so I really wanted to come to Oxford for quite a long time. I think even before MB, MBB program even started. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I got, um, I think I this, that one of the best pieces of advice is like to get in touch with alumni, especially of similar background of the country that you are from. I think it helped some of us to prepare for this experience. And uh, I was very encouraged by people from 2016 cohort, some of my friends to, to go to the MPP as such. Mm, and yeah, but for me it was so actually I applied 2019, 2020. I got accepted both times, but it was COVID. I had other things to do, so I had to resign. And I think also if you don't get accepted to understand that this is the cohort composition, the people here think about how you can bring the value to the cohort, it's not always just about you. So right, I think what what really mattered that I got also some materials from people who studied here. I could like take a look at the syllabus get more like talking to like two three four different people you got like the feeling what it might be like and i think i haven't met a person who said that it wasn't worth it so yeah i think it was very useful thank you hello yeah if i can um add on what leshek has mentioned because i agree completely uh what he said i also reach out to peruvian alumni is so powerful to listen from people that have experienced the MPP. Um, but in my opinion, in my personal experience, why I chose the MPP at BSG is because, as I mentioned, I, I have a professional experience already. Um, so technical or specific knowledge is not what I was looking for. Actually, I wanted to have uh, general um, foundations and knowledge of what is policy making, right? Uh, and this is actually the purpose of the MPP at, at the University of Oxford. They train us to be generalists. And for instance, in this first term, which is called Michaelmas term in Oxford, we've had economics, policy challenge, and foundations, which is philosophy, political philosophy. And it is, it is helping me uh, as a professional to, first of all, develop leadership skills, also how to, and I was, I, I remember I wrote it in my, in my, application essay, I want to know how to do a well done cost benefit analysis without being an economic, an economic, an economist, right? I'm a lawyer, but I want to know how to do that. And being in a cohort where there are economists, uh, managers, uh, right? Doctors, we got these very diverse insights in each conversation that we have that it really helps us. So uh, that's one of the aspects. And the second one is I wanted to study in a university that brings the most diverse and international class, and that is Oxford. And I found it. Uh, I did a very profound and deep research among the best universities in the world. And of course, um, Blavatnik was my first option. And I'm grateful to be here. And I just would like to encourage anyone that is uh, listening to, to this um session don't believe that oxford is unreachable nothing is impossible so uh if you agree that you want to study uh in an mpp that is more generalist this is the best option for you thank you so much paula so my next question is slightly different so oxford university has quite a particular system when it comes to its colleges so how did each of you go about choosing your college? I'll start with Luisa. Well, actually, my experience was uh, very particular. I did some research, uh, asked around uh, people and chose one, but my scholarship moved me to another one. Okay. So at the end, I didn't get to choose. However, I am very happy and I recommend that you look into Cuba College, <laughs> especially for graduate students. It's, uh, it's really like their accumulations are great. Their like support team is great. It, we have the most beautiful dining hall in Oxford, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so yeah, I would move, but I'm very happy. To recommend 100. How about you, Lesha? Right. So I think this is one of the things that you might try to. Well, I don't think it's very easy to make this kind of decisions mm -hmm. to balance from the outside. The only way I think that could help you is to really talk to people who did Oxford, not necessarily as, oh, 
I mean, will be best with their graduates, of course, because the graduate and undergraduate experience is very different with college. Mm. The college is not that important for graduate students. So there are some people who don't really go to the colleges. There are some who actually spend a lot of time over there. So I think like going for the most famous colleges, it was my case, um, it's not the best option. I think you might try to see what kind of people are in your college, like, because you might do Bit, a bit more like work in the college with people who have similar interests to yours to see if your college is actually organizing anything that is like of particular interest to you because then after you know the seminar the conference you can go to the you know if you're invited to the high table which is like for the professors and you know the, you can carry on discussions and um so i see that for example people really appreciate Saint Anthony's college so the people going there it's just like the graduate college for uh it's a relatively new college so people perhaps don't, are not as interested, but I know that a lot of people actually like it. And yeah, so I will explore, yeah, I'll try to explore beyond that kind of, you know, not don't try to apply to Christchurch, I think, just because you, know, <laughs> you might not get there, but then you will be assigned to the college. So I don't think that anyone has like particularly bad experience with the college. Ooh. Also helps if you have a college not too far away from the BSG, because then you can actually socialize there, you can go there during the breaks, you can go there for lunch. Lunches are actually quite cheap in colleges. So go beyond the usual suspects, like five most famous names you might, you know, came up with. Try to check the faculty, try to, if you can, reach out to, to us, to, to other graduates to talk about their experience with their colleges. And yeah, and so uh, and still you might be assigned to the college anyway. So I mean, don't worry too much. But yeah, do your homework. Yeah, I think wherever you end up, it will be a bit of a community for you. And you'll have a great time. So how about you two, Victor? How did you choose your college? So eight months ago, I would have been on an emergency medicine rotation. And I found out that like I got the email of choosing my college and mm. I did some very quick research and, and just randomly kind of chose. So I would not recommend doing what I did um, because I was very busy and you probably shouldn't do that. But I agree with, with what Leszek says and that, you know, there are many factors that go into someone's experience at a college. Um, and that can be like location, how far it is from, B, from the uh, MPP campus, it can also be the graduate community. Um, I, I'm actually at Christchurch, so that's like this fancy college and, and everyone is asking to come and, and do dinner at my college. Um, and I'm glad that I got, you know, that I got into that college. Um, but had I done more research, I would have also considered other places um, and 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 thought about like graduate accommodation and things like that. So I, I would just like Leszek said, do your homework um, and try to find one that is not necessarily like the most prestigious college, but one that is more the right fit for you. Sounds very sensible. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I am in Pembroke College. Uh, I need to be completely honest. Well, all my answers are very honest. I didn't research at all. <laughs> I was very busy working in the Peruvian government when I applied. And so what I did was text my, my friends who are alumni from uh, the MVP to get some advice. They all said, Wow, don't worry. Like, they're all good. Uh, it depends, of course, on you if you want only graduates, if you're looking for accommodation in the college, or if you prefer uh, kind of people, because there are some that are towards uh, social sciences, right? Uh, but I didn't have time, so I just clicked. I am okay with whatever you want to assign me. And I came into Pembroke College. I'm really happy uh, with that. Um, but if I would have the time to research, I would have done it. Why? And I do recommend you take your time. You still have until January. Um, for instance, and location for me is so important. Even though Oxford is a small uh, city, um, MPPs, we tend to be all together all the time. Yeah, <laughs> so we go to uh, have lunch or to a pub at night. and. Everything is around Jericho. So I would really love to have applied to Somerville, which is um, a college right next to Blavatnik. And it's actually, to me, a powerful because it's the college that first accepted women. And if you go to the dining hall, you'll see portraits of women <coughs> all over. So to me, that's like powerful, right? That's why I would, I would go for that. But if you, if you want location, you got St. Anthony, St. Anne's, uh, Green Temple, so... 
I would say everything is about you and your priorities. What do you want? Do you want uh, only graduates? Do you want somewhere where you can have lunch? St. Cross has the best lunch ever. It's cheap and very close to BSE, for instance. So my recommendation would be uh, speak to people who have studied here, define your priorities, and that's key for everything, like for your life in Oxford, for your college, um, choice uh, for what you want to do in the summer project and, and all around. So it's important to be uh, self-aware of what you want. May I add something? Yes. So for, for me, yeah, something that has been really uh, cool from some of the colleges is how inviting they are, they are to other people that are not from that college. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have uh, here in Oxford, the this is just one example, the formals, which are like formal dinners that happen every now and then in every college. In my college, it, it, uh, formals are three times a week, which is nice because in, in some others it's just once. This isn't that important, but what I was trying to say is that I get three opportunities a week to bring friends over mm -hmm. and I get to invite two people every time. Unlike others that have only like formals once a week and you can invite just one person or like they're very close. So in my case, being able to invite uh, my friends has been something that I really appreciate uh, about this college. So if uh, the social aspect is important for you, this is something that you uh, definitely should like ask about. Yeah. I promise last thing, <clears throat> but joining a college is not the end or be all. Like, Louise, that said, right? So the thing is, even if you don't get into a certain college that you want to, pretty much all of the MPPs spend evenings at other colleges, yes. going to people's formals, checking out other places, you know, getting tours. So no matter what college you're in, you'll get a chance to have lunch at mm -hmm. St. Cross if you yes. want or um, whatever, whatever colleges that your friends are also at. Yes, so I think although it will be an important part of your year at Oxford, it's not something to get too stressed over mm -hmm. because you'll get something a bit different from every college and you'll still have the opportunity to visit other colleges and spend time in other places. Um, so my next question is what is the social life like amongst the MPP cohort? Mm. So I'll pass over, first of all, to Paula, who is the social rep for the course. <laughs> so we're very lucky to have her with us today. Amazing. <laughs> yes, well, the social life in Oxford, per se, is intense. <laughs> and you will not get bored because there is always something to do. Uh, in the MPP, of course, it's even more fun. Um, I would like to mention that in the MPP, we have many student-led activities, even before the student reps were elected. So that was amazing. And I think this is what makes very special of the MPP at Lavadnik, that the admissions team pick like very special people that are, when we're all together, it's like magic, really. Uh, for instance, we have this very pathetic walks that has uh, is an initiative of Victor, Vic, Victor, sorry, from Brazil, um, who invited us to go for a walk with a different pair each week. And with that, we go explore the city and get to know more people, right? We also have cultural nights in a monthly basis. Actually, we had the Valley celebration. It was amazing getting to uh, eat uh, Indian food, dance, Bollywood. It was amazing. And this Thursday, we have the African Cultural Night, which I'm very looking forward to. Um, and yes, uh, we have a lot to do. Also, we had the end of term soiree last week. Um, and different activities, even uh, which is mingled with other with other students. For instance, we have a group that um, is very into yoga, and we had uh, a meetup with the with the group of yoga that the MBA has here in Oxford as well. And we had some drinks, some snacks. So social life, I would say it's open to any activity you may have. Uh, and every day we have birthday, for instance. Uh, this week, <laughs> we're having three. Tomorrow is Lesha's birthday as well. And you just need to text in the group. Guys, I'm celebrating my birthday in this restaurant, and you will get the restaurant full of MPPs, as always. There are always <laughs> MPP takeovers. So yeah, uh, it's so fun. And we don't let the intensity of the program, per se, um, uh, drive us into only studying. It's it's actually very 
uh, very nice. I'm forgetting about the bobs uh, and colleges that, mm. yeah, even though, for instance, I'm not from St. Cards, but we did uh, sex of us after the matriculation day or Christmas bob. So there are infinite activities, guys. <laughs> you, you will have fun in Oxford, definitely. Definitely. And outside of the school, there are so many clubs and societies you can get involved in and sports activities. So there really is just so much on offer. So I think it would be Yeah, I'm it. so excited about this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the social aspect is one of my like top three favorite things about uh, Oxford, about this school, about this town. So just to give you an example of like uh, something that could happen, like ran, like a random day, you're like with your friends, where, where your friends at uh, like an academic activity, and then you're like, let's go for a um, for a, uh, let's go have lunch, for example. Then you have a lunch, you you always bump into somebody in the street, and you're like, yeah, come over, come over, and then more people join lunch, and then. Yeah, then the group splits and some go for coffee, some or go for something. And then in the in the way they we're all in our bicycles, I think about like a stranger things, all that you know, like <laughs> the little kids in bicycles. So because Oxford is so small, we're on our bikes every day, like almost every uh, all day, every day. So you're like in your bicycle with your buddies like going around town <laughs> and then you bump into somebody and somebody and you're like, what's up? And they're like, not much. And you're like, come over, and then everybody like joins, <laughs> and then you go and like hang out in the common room of a college, and then it's nine, and you're like, well, let's go for drinks, let's see what people are up to, and there's always like an event going on. It's just like fun, fun. Academics are tough, are tough, like it, they are very intense, but as Paul said, there's always space to um to like get together with people through colleges, through uh, school activities, through BSG, to just like life, you make friends like all of the time. So yeah, Oxford is amazing. Yeah, I think one thing your year at Oxford won't be as boring, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so you've actually led me quite nicely on to the next question, which is about how intensive you would say the classes are and have you got any tips for managing what is going to be quite a busy workload so I'll start with you Michelle. right so there are like two ways of doing this I would say <laughs> uh, one is what is the proper way that school expects you to do so basically you spend two three hours reading every day on top of the classes that you have and the classes you have Mondays Tuesdays pretty busy then it's getting a bit relaxed but still quite a lot and if you have like any sports or an additional things you feel overwhelmed so if you want to have social life, you basically skip some readings <laughs> and at least in some week weeks and because of the, we also have like assignments. So just I think it wasn't clear to like most of us that you basically don't have exams until April, <laughs> mid-April. So actually they're gonna ruin your second break. So not your first break. We are just about to approach. Thank you. How about you, Victor? You got any tips? You know, I would really agree with Leszek on that. Um, that they do give quite a good amount of readings uh, for the classes. So whether it's economics or it's the foundation political philosophy class, you do have a lot to prepare before you come into class. Um, I think the entire Oxford experience is really around, uh, is really centered on prioritization. Like there's so many things to do and to learn, and it is impossible to do all of those things. So I think you know, one thing for me, I came into the MVP knowing my priorities and like really understanding economics. So like I like took a deep dive into economics and prioritized that over the other courses because because it was important to me. Mm -hmm. um, whereas others came in and really wanted to know a lot more about political philosophy and so like really prioritized that class. Um, so I think you know in this time where you don't have the the sort of bandwidth to do everything knowing the one or two things that you really want to leave with at the end of the day having a better knowledge of is important um and you know i i think the other the other tip that i would have is really for me what's worked is just prioritizing the weekend so like really trying to like get most of the readings done on like sort of Saturday and then Sunday, and then I have a week to sort of relax and do other social things that Paula organizes. <laughs> if I may jump in, um, there's something that we always say, and it is that MVP is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And I always remember what Professor Karthik Ramana, uh, co-director of the program said, is that 
they are training us to be the next prime ministers, presidents, or uh, very VC roles, whatever it is in private, uh, third sector, or in the private, uh, in the public sector, right? And if you imagine, and actually, I always thought about uh, my former boss. She didn't have the time to read everything, and it's, uh, this. This is what Karthik said. You don't need to read everything, but learn how to do it. And actually, I uh, this this term I've worked with a study group. So we organized ourselves, all the readings, because yes, there are a lot and we need to be prepared for the class in order to make the most of it, right? Because if we have read uh, all the required readings, because yes, there are also further readings and there are also <laughs> there, there are the further and the suggested readings, so there's a long list. Um, if you have read that, you will make the most of the conversation with the lecturer and all the experts that um, Dravatnik invites. So we can make more interesting questions. I have, um, you know, make the most of it. And that's what we did, for instance, and I think it worked pretty well. Like, since the beginning of the course, I think it was week two, we divided all the readings and all of the summaries were uploaded in the Google Drive by uh, before before the week started. Um, it worked very very well, uh, but uh, it's really and I think we all agree in this table that depends on you. What are your priorities? What do you feel is the best for you? Because some people is just no, I need to read it myself, and it's just uh, a thing of prioritizing, organizing their, their schedule. And a very important thing also is that here, the University of Oxford, your college, Blavatnik School of Government, uh, and the student reps, uh, we all take very seriously our wellness and welfare. So we have many activities to try to help each other and giving support. And actually one of, one of the activities, so you can get an idea of it, is like, we're going to have a dog therapy visit uh, next week. Uh, with the college, we can do also dog therapy walks or even a small support groups. So, yeah, it's it's an overall experience. The intensity the intensity is high, but we can work on that. Yeah, for sure. And I think learning to prioritize your tasks and your activities inside and outside of work is only going to serve you all really well in the future in your careers so jumping to a slightly different question again how did you all prepare to move countries to undertake a master's degree and are there any tips you would give to people who might be just moving far away to come to Oxford um, so I'll start with Louise. Ooh, yeah, I made so many lists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it depends on what you're doing back home, right? So I need I needed to finish things in work. I needed to like run a bunch of errands. Uh, I need to uh, like buy and prepare stuff to come here. So I just made lists and lists and checked as many items as I could, prioritize. I mean, this is like a basic important and urgent diagram, you know. Uh, so just like any other task, I there were things that I needed to get uh, done, like get ready before uh, coming and some others that I need to like bring with me. And like when you're there, uh, the school also has a very good job of like of telling you uh school i mean like B bsg and oxford they they start start sending you emails like these are things that you need to prepare so like all of those like tactical things you like don't worry about them right now because you'll get information out and also uh, whatsapp groups i will start to be created uh, with uh, people who are, who will be coming with you so uh, you'll get a lot of information on like what to bring, what to do. So um, don't worry much about it. Check as much af as you can have. And it's not a problem if you check everything, you know. Um, yeah. How about you, Lesha? Well, I think it's different with people who come from very far. And uh, I think it's my case, actually, most of you are I'm from Poland. So you know, I came with like one big bag and the rest of the stuff just got like, you know, well, shipped. It was like in the car. It's like a lot of things are way easier when you are based in, in Europe. And mm -hmm. then you basically just check what you need. And of course, for a couple of weeks, you sleep in a sleeping bag or something. But then you get the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think it's um, what could be important for you is to, especially for those, or those of you who might be like coming with families, for example, 
that would be some kind of research you would like to be done way before the term starts. My family stayed in Poland, and I mean, and I think actually it was a smart decision because I see how difficult it would be for me to try to juggle everything I'm doing here with also being with them. Uh, I can't really imagine uh, how difficult it is. Some people came with families, and I really respect them for that. Some of those people who are, are also working by having kids, uh, not the people at BSG, but the partners. And I think you really need to have this conversation if you have someone in your life. Some people are doing like remote relationship and you know might not see each other for like half a year. Some of the school can come. I think it's actually relatively easy in terms of like you know, accommodation if you want to stay. Mm, yeah, I think this is the most important thing to figure out, you know, this kind of personal relationships. And if you if your partners or your family gives you the space to actually be committed, uh, don't imagine that you'll be even being here with them, you have so much time to to give them, right? I mean, you can, but then you also, you have to make some sacrifices on behalf of the PSG life. So I think this is one of the kind of hardest decisions, I think, for everyone and each of you to, to make in the coming months. Thank you. So we have a question that's come through online, which is about how relevant are the course modules for someone who would want to make a career in impact investment? So I am not sure who might want to answer that, but I think one thing we can say about the MPP, and I think we've mentioned it already, is that it is a really good course for preparing you in a general sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are economics modules there are more sort of practical skills yes. based sessions that are going to be applicable to whatever sort of career you're going into that wants to have a good impact um I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that well we have uh people who have worked in finance in our cohort yeah so, um I bet that um like there are common interests uh, there with somebody who uh, works on um, in investment and finance. I don't know anything about yeah about it, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, this is certainly useful. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And there are always practitioners who are coming in to talk to our MPP students about their experiences, and so you'll get a lot of insights from people who are actually in those industries doing those jobs as well so yeah i think it's important for you to to understand this course is not going to make you i think uh, victor said it like economists or the lawyers right some of us has these backgrounds and have these classes and but not the others you have a very specific thing in mind if you you know want to be i know like in engineer who makes impact in the climate change you know it's like you might reconsider if you want to apply here because like this is the course which helps you to understand how the public policy works how the politics works how what are the values inner values that are hidden that we don't sometimes understand so i think for impact investor if you have the kind of technical knowledge understanding the social and political kind of issues connected with this this course will be helpful mm -hmm. Because you can't find a thing that, you know, impact investor course at Harvard or Oxford, right? But if you are looking for very particular skills and not necessarily public policy skills, political skills, uh, this is not a specialized course. I mean, so if you really want to do economics, I mean, do economics and not, not you know, eight weeks wouldn't make you an, an economist or the international lawyer. So, yeah, and I think it's worth checking what kind of modules you're going to have here uh, before before making a decision because you don't want to end up with, you know, doing like one module out of seven, which you find really interesting for your career, right? Definitely, that's really good advice. Um, so we had a couple of questions pre-submitted about scholarships. Um, so my question would be, are you studying with us on a scholarship and how did you sort of go about researching and finding funding to help support your studies here? Can start with Victor? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, I am very fortunate to be on a scholarship here. Um, I'm on the Eisenhower Global Scholarship, which is this fellowship for students um, from the U.S. who want to study either the MPP at Oxford or a very similar degree at a university in Spain. Um, how I went about finding it. So actually, um, the Blavatnik School of Government does a good job of sending their uh, their uh, people who they've accepted into the degree emails about scholarship opportunities. So I actually found out about the Eisenhower Global Scholarship through an email that I got from BSG, and then I, I applied and, and then won that scholarship. Um, many of my classmates do a, a bunch of research also before the before even getting accepted, and there are a bunch of scholarships, including Shevening, including a, num a number of other opportunities that for which the deadline is due, I would say probably around the same time or maybe even a little before the application for BSG is due. And so I would, if you're planning on applying to the MPP here, I would do research as soon as possible even before submitting the MVP application. But if you've already submitted an application, just, you know, uh, just trying to do research for a scholarship until you can, you can find one that fits for you and then uh, potentially win that opportunity. Yes, so I know that both Paula and Luisa are on Chevening scholarships. And so the deadline for that, I believe, was in November. Yes. However, <laughs> there are an awful lot of scholarship opportunities available at the university, um, within the school and from external sources. And so we really recommend, as Victor said, starting to look as soon as you possibly can. And there's lots of advice available on our website on the MPP fees and funding page. Yeah, I'm actually on a scholarship, which is like, um, like uh, it's a joint scholarship between Achievening, uh, which is the one that Pao pa has, and another scholarship which is specific to Oxford, which is called by Denfeld Hoffman. So there are many outside resources that you can, uh, like in which you can get informed about scholarships, like what uh, Victor was saying. But uh, there are some other options that. So some other scholarships that you can apply to when you apply to Oxford. So that's what I did for this one. So when you uh, send your form, they, they will ask you like, do you want to apply to this and this scholarship? And you can tick like, yes. And in that case, they might ask you like additional questions. Sometimes the school just considers you for this other scholarship, but for, for this one in particular, uh, I had to uh, fill another form. So you want to uh, take a look at the application before, before you apply, because you might need extra time to get prepared for those uh, forms. So you want to send your application on the very last day because you might bump into like additional forms that you uh, would need to uh, fill in. And this one in particular is really, really nice. It's very similar to Chimning, like it covers your 100% the of your tuition and it gives you like a monthly stipend. So it's really good. Biden, Hoffman, look it up. Uh, you can study any, I think any master's degree in here in Oxford. Um, so yeah, there are, several options. Yes, and actually 83% of the current MPP students are receiving some sort of funding to help support their studies. And so there really is a lot of help available out there. And so we just really encourage you to have a, have a really good look around at what's available. And as Louisa said, make sure that you're not leaving your application to the very last minute, just in case something comes up and you really want to make a good case for yourself mm. and why you should be chosen for some financial support. I think some colleges also have scholarships, right? So yeah. that, that could be an additional factor for you to consider when you're applying to your college. Uh, but uh, there's like a lot of research uh, that you would need to do in like advance. Don't leave, again, don't leave that to towards the end um, to find a good scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, just very quick. Uh, I would want to say I do have a scholarship that's chiving in, but it is a very long process. So, for instance, when I got accepted in, in the MPP, you get the response in March, okay? But that time I didn't go, I didn't have the answer from Chivinin. Uh, and I remember, and I do want to highlight this, um, the admissions team don't want uh, to, to have the fees and funding thing as a, a stress for, for the applicants. So don't think uh, that 
please don't consider that to prevent you from applying mm -hmm. because Really, the admissions tip is very helpful. As as Victor mentioned with me, they also uh, offered me some scholarships. I needed to complete a form, some questions. So the B BSG would, um, how can I say, uh, they would uh, send my information to the different scholarships they have in the University of mm -hmm. Oxford, which are several, also from colleges. And, and they say, don't worry, we're, we're waiting because... <gasps> Uh, the response for achieving scholarships comes in June. So yes, it's a very mm -hmm. stressful period and we develop tolerance and patience. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, and, and I know cases of people that are studying now in Oxford and knew about their funding in July. So don't be stressed about that. Just focus now on your admission, the, the three essays or two essays, I'm not sure, and work on that. Uh, yeah, so my guess is different than yours because I'm mostly self funded and I, as I told you, I applied like three times. And for, to be honest, if the school didn't offer me, I think like 25% of the tuition fees, which are quite high, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it basically because I'm like extremely short of money and life here is very expensive. Uh, so yeah, and I mean, for some of you, like at the same time, remember that you have to actually pay for your, I mean, for yourself until potentially end of August, if your summer project go goes through this long, at least like end of July, because that's how long you have to, and you might spend this time in New York, you know, or somewhere, not, not in Oxford, mm -hmm. so even more expensive place. And of course, don't stress out too much about money, but you need to fill in your financial declaration, and that is possible that you wouldn't get funds. And you have to figure it out in spring, like the plan B, if you don't get these funds, like somehow. And don't count on the fact that you would be accepted. You will have the money for that because you have to pay up the money for the fees like up front. And don't believe that you come here and magically find, you know, 15,000 pounds for the rest of your year because you wouldn't. I mean, you might get some support if you get in trouble from the college, but it's not doesn't work like this. Did you come here and you just get funding for, for your life? And you wouldn't be able to like, a, most, some people are trying to work a little bit, but it's not, it's extremely hard to do, I mean, almost impossible to yeah. uh, a real job. So also don't count on this. And uh, no one, you know, if you can't afford it, just don't do it. That's, that's my advice. Yeah, I think it's really important to do a budget for yourself and try to work out how much not only the course is going to cost, but how much your monthly outgoings are going to be. If you have any dependents, you'll need to think about that. So I think that's really good advice to be sort of very realistic about the financial aspect of it. So we have another question coming in online. Um, does, do you, any of you have any advice for the policy essay in the uh, application process? And how did you approach writing that? Yeah, so I'll start, I'll start with Lisa. Yeah, well, I focus on something that I also really an expert on <laughs> so of course you you want to like show up a little bit <laughs> it's not too long though i think i think it was uh 800 uh words so i within the field in which i worked on i looked for a subject in which i felt really confident and in which i had like maybe already like done some work and and yeah i remember that I made it look like really nice and so not only the content was really good but I, I like uh like had like a like a minor editing with like boxes in the side so like it looked very professional wow. yeah 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 so I made it look like a professional document mm -hmm. that's a very good tip <laughs> how about you Leslie? So I, got, I did a really shitty job, <laughs> but I had like three opportunities to amend, so some stuff I didn't, so basically I had to, but with policy faith, actually, I did change it, uh, because I learned in the course of how to actually line to, like, write a policy paper, and the advice is out there, so, if, so for those of you who didn't write policy papers, I don't, I write a lot, but not policy papers, mm -hmm. so I, of course, they like the first one, and I know, political parties in Poland, yeah, something that you know, but the format of, of the policy paper, if it's the same as we applied, it's, it's kind of like, it's very specific. So you might mm -hmm. go for some piece of advice, how to actually write these kind of things, because this is what they want to see. If you have this 
policy approach, you know, write now nice abstract. I think Lisa with, with this is great, like you know, bullet points or very clear structure, because you also here you would learn how to write in a clear language. They want you to answer the question, you know. <clears throat> so I think that could be very useful if you focus on what would be your question, what kind of questions you want to answer, what kind of advice, if it's like the advice you, you are going to give on to whatever policymaker. So yeah, go and go and check how those things are written. And there is a lot of advice that you, you might find online. This was I, something I haven't done too much at the beginning, and I think that could be very useful for you. Thank you. Great. You approach the policy to say. So, I really agree with everything that Leszek and Louisa said. I think really focusing on something that is within your purview of knowledge and expertise is very helpful. The one thing that I will add is that I also chose uh, a policy that I was actually very passionate about. Um, and so even the policy briefing document or the, po the policy essay was very much in alignment with my personal statement, very much in alignment with the other things that I had submitted. So it just, you know, I, obviously I tried to make it as professional as possible. I tried to show my expertise in that area, but at the same time, it aligned with the story that I had told of who I am. Um, and I think that that, that that story that you're presenting is what is going to leave an impression on like application leaders. And so for me, that's the one thing that I would add um, just to make sure that you're writing about something that you also care about. That's really good advice. I think if it's something you're passionate about, it's really going to shine through in what you write. How about you, Paula? Do you have anything to add? Um, no, not really. It's <laughs> all true. Um, yeah. Actually, I remember I looked for how do policy briefings uh, were made in, in Europe because I was not sure if Latin America, we were using different formats, right? Mm. Um, so I found several from the OECD, um, World Bank, to see how they are. Very similar, to be honest. Um, so I work on it. I think it, it to me, it was kind of, uh, I think we can deal with similar. I work on a topic that really uh, I, I know about and passionate about. And actually, it was very tied to what I said in my personal statement. Mm -hmm. um, what What is your goal, right? Why do you want to? come to Blavatnik to learn uh, about the foundations of policy making. Um, and yeah, my my personal uh, purpose, for instance, is bridging the digital gender gap in my country. So I talked about that in the policy brief. And yes, it's what you said, Victor, you need to tell Blavatnik or the admissions team, what is your story? And all the essays need to go aligned with that. And it applies, I think, the same to the achieving in a uh, scholarship or whatever you want to go in front of a judge's team, mm -hmm. it's a story what you want to tell. It's really good advice. Thank you. Um, so a slightly different question again. Is there any career support available while at the school and do you have opportunities to be mentored? So I'll start with Victor. Sure. Um, I almost uh, sort of chuckled at this question because there is so much, there's too much support. Like they they, they yeah. shove kind of the career support down your throat a little bit, which is a good thing. Um, and so there is uh, a careers office here that helps with looking at your CV, looking at your resume, um, which I've, I've used personally has been helpful for me. Um, there are also services for people to talk with someone to think about your long term career goals. I think a lot of students come into the MPP sort of at a point where they're saying, you know, I am looking for career change. And so there are people who are here at the school where you can chat with about that. Um, they also do set you up with a mentor. Um, so one, so there's one faculty member who's paired to multiple students, and so you will have your own faculty mentor who you maintain a relationship with throughout the course of uh, the year as well. And there are also other sort of mentoring schemes that the school, uh, that you have to apply into that the school uh, offers as well. So there's a bunch of career support, I think. Personally, I found it very helpful, and I know that like they uh, offer services that can help when you're thinking about whether it's changing a career or like applying to your summer project. There's there are really just tons of resources here. Anyone want to add anything? I think that answers the question. Yeah, <laughs> you're not alone here. Yeah, you know, there's always a support for like whatever you you need. Yeah.
Yeah, and I think many people come here with a very clear idea of what they want to do next, and then that changes quite a lot mm -hmm. during the year, and so it's good to have that support. Yeah, maybe just to add, apart from what we have from the university as a whole, we have the cohort itself. Mm -hmm. We're 144 students that had different networks and we are working on that already. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I would love that we have um, friends and students from Asia that want to do something in Latin America. And of course, we are uh, 19 students from Latin America that can help him get to contact because if I don't know someone from the Ministry of Transport, let's say, I know someone that knows someone. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it is. Uh, as Lou said, you're not alone. Uh, mm -hmm. You will get it. And if not, we will help to get it. <laughs> Yeah. And so we've got about just over five minutes left. So we'll take a couple more questions. So if there are any more questions online, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, one question that was pre-submitted to us is, what are the libraries at Oxford like? Mm -hmm. um, so who would like to start with that one? Have you had a lot of experience of studying in places other than the school? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I mean, Radcam is so beautiful, which is like the, the typical building that uh, you see when you Google Oxford. I remember the first time I, I stepped in because you, you get your uh, bot card, like your Oxford ID. Uh, I like pass by the, you know, like the check-in. Mm -hmm. And it like the little light turned red, uh, from red to green, and I was like letting, and I was like so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it this are like this city is just beautiful, right? And um, that translate in, tra translates into the building, like inside of the buildings too. So that library is just amazing. You see people from all ages that look very different between them like working on so many different stuff it's just and the buildings are like magnificent and you're like you're like studying and at some point you like take a break and you're like oh wow where am I <laughs> um and then uh, the, the colleges itself uh, they, they themselves they also have their their uh, uh, libraries, mine is really, really nice. I also like working outside libraries though, because sometimes you want to have a break and speak with your friend and maybe have like a quick bite and have a laugh. Yeah. Um, but if you love libraries, I mean, this is the place. I, <laughs> I think this city is built to like encourage you to study. <laughs> so, Spot on. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think for the final question, I'm just going to ask each of you to give one final tip to the people listening who might be about to submit their applications, uh, who are thinking about planning for their year at Oxford. Do you have any final tips that you would share with our listeners? I'll start with you, Leshek. Be prepared that with whatever you're applying and bringing here, it would be very much transformed. So I wouldn't like bet my money on the fact that you'll be doing exactly the same thing as you're applying just right now. Mm -hmm. So be prepared, be open to change, be prepared to be, don't come with a closed mind, come and experience and see how it transforms you because it's a journey and I think you're really going to enjoy it if you allow yourself to do this. So yeah, come with priorities, but also be, be, be happy to be able to change them. I think it'll be very useful. Um, well, if it comes to tips for the application, I would say like show uh, that you're passionate about um, improving other people's lives. I think that's uh, what the school is looking for. I mean, and if you are, it will show. Um, I think, so like we have spoken a lot about how it is to uh, live in Oxford, you know, experience this school in like these very different ways. I think I would add some of that into the application too. You know, you're not just coming here to like go to the classroom and study and say yes, 
you want to live this experience. So if I were to, if I were in the admissions team, I would be like, this person really knows where they're trying uh, to go. And I wanted to say something to encourage you to apply. Um, I, when I was preparing my applications, I applied to multiple um, schools, like the best schools in the world, I think. And in that process, I spoke with people who have been to those schools, you know, Colombian, Colum Colombian friends who have been to, you know, Columbia, Harvard, Chicago, um, uh, LSE. And out of them, I think none of them speak with such excitement and passion as the people who came to Oxford before me. Yeah. It, this place is just unbelievable. Try it out, like give it a try. Uh, as Paul said, this it, like it seems like out of reach, but it, it's it's too old. I just my so support what you said, what you bring to the table. I think it's extremely important because this is the common learning and what you bring to the table. I think yes. people would appreciate it. Yes, that you can provide something to the rest of us here. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, you guys stole my point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. It was my point. I was just a boy. <laughs> <laughs> <Really? laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Really, what I was going to say is to believe in your story, to believe in the work that you've done. Uh, there's a reason that you want to go get an MPP. And hopefully that reason is to serve people in your community, to serve the country that you're from, to serve the causes that you're passionate about. And um, you've had experience in the past to, to back that up. So I would believe in your story. I think a lot of us who are in the class now were a year ago in your shoes, like applying and like were worried about whether we get in and like sort of um, uh, this has kind of been a dream come true for a lot of the students here. And so I would say that each of you has an amazing story. I would believe in that story and I would lean into it as you're into the MVP, but also in to, to fuel you as you as you continue your education and go into the amazing work that all of you guys are going to do. Thank you. Well, they have made all the very <laughs> points for you. I will just go to a very uh, practical point. It says, your story, that's what you need to say. Uh, but make sure that you tell Blavatnik, the admissions team, what are you bringing to the course? That's so important. Um, I don't know exactly what the admissions team is looking for, uh, but what I've seen in my class is that we're all change makers so inspiring people that we do want to make an impact in the world in different aspects and sectors. So there is no specific profile. I, I, I get this question many times in my Instagram. What is the profile of this student of Oxford? There is no one profile. Uh, just be passionate, but be really clear when you write your essay. Make sure that preferably MPP alumni read your essays so they can help you um, if you are really uh, translating the message through that words. Because it's difficult to write in 500 words, uh, right? But make sure that it's clear because I will be, it will be really a pity that you have a really nice story, inspiring one, but you don't translate it. And that's why uh, the, the admission tips do not get you. Uh, but yes, I would say that. And Follow uh, Blavatnik's Instagram, Twitter, because they're always, uh, they always they always do these takeovers. And many of us as students are showing how we live. If you're curious about that, I would really encourage so you can follow that as well. Follow Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you will find my handle in this account. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I think I would echo just what Paula said as well about getting someone else to read your application mm. is always going to be helpful because it doesn't come necessarily super easy to everyone to sell yourself, but people who know you well in your inner circle, I guess, will know your strengths and know who you are and will be able to help you show the best version of yourself to the admissions team. So... I think that would be a really good thing to do if you can. So I think we're out of time. So all that's left to say is a huge thank you to our MPP students for joining me today. It's been really great and useful to hear from all of you, your experiences. So thank you for your time. 
And to everyone who joined, thank you so much for staying and listening to us all. And if you're applying for the course, please remember that the deadline is Friday the 6th of January. And we recommend getting in your applications as soon as possible so you can make sure you have time to apply for those scholarships that might appear and, you know, you don't want any technical difficulties at the last minute that means you have to wait another year. So try and give yourself as much time as possible. Um, so thank you very much and goodbye from Oxford. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck.